This is 1988 Tops, where every card has a story to tell. Your hosts are David McKellis and Matt Kuzma. Let's play ball. Welcome back to 1988 Tops. David, what's our card for this week? Two cards this week. Card number 537, Steve Bouchel, third baseman, Texas Rangers, and the Texas Rangers team leaders card, card number 201. All right, another double card episode. We are making real progress through this stack of cards, David. But before we get to that, we do have some follow-up about last week's episode on Kevin McReynolds. Man, I got a note about Kevin McReynolds' first tops card. Can you consult the 1988 Beckett Guide to see if there's any notes about this Kevin McReynolds card number 735? I've got the guide right here. The November 1988 Beckett Baseball Card Monthly Guide with Jose Canseco on the front. And flipping to the guide, card 735, Kevin McReynolds. And next to it, it says FTC and a mint condition price of 15 cents. Big money for Kevin McReynolds. But this was not Kevin McReynolds' rookie card. As we discussed on the podcast, Kevin McReynolds was traded for four or five other Kevins to the Mets from the Padres. And so he should have had a couple tops cards prior to that with the Padres. I got a note from listener Chad on Facebook who said, If I remember correctly, Kevin did not have a contract with the Topps Corporation for his first few years in the big leagues. As an avid card collector, I would have the Beckett magazine delivered to my house. 1984 Donruss and Fleer were Kevin's rookie cards. Normally, Tops would come out with a traded set, which would not be considered a, quote, rookie card, but an XRC, or extended rookie card, due to having to buy the full set instead of a pack. The first card issued by Tops purchased in a pack would be the FTC. That's when, That one is marked as an FTC. Apparently, this is because Kevin did not sign a specific deal with the Topps Corporation for his likeness and name and licensing when he was a rookie. So then I think five years in, he got rolled into the MLBPA contract. Uh, I, I am an attorney. I am not a baseball card attorney. You know, this was some kind of complicated situation that led to that 1988 Topps card being very valuable, 15 cents, as Kevin McReynolds' first Topps card. A good bit of reconnaissance done by Chad on Facebook. Thank you for sending that in. David, I disagree with your the premise that you are not a baseball card lawyer. I think that you are officially a baseball card lawyer now. But if there are others out there who can shed some light on the situation, you can reach out to us on Facebook. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash 1988topspodcast. But now let's go to today's card, with Steve Bouchel. And why are we talking about Steve today? Steve Bouchel was requested by at 32 Ephus, Levi Weaver on Twitter. And Levi is the Texas Rangers correspondent for The Athletic. We probably could have talked about Steve Bouchel and this Texas Rangers team leaders card when we talked about Pete Incavilia. But also featured on there is a laughing Steve Bouchel. I was tweeting about how we forgot to do this team leaders card. And Levi said, how long until this alleged Steve Bouchel episode? <laughs> he said, 88 top Steve Bouchel was my first baseball card, so I've been waiting for this. You know, that was in January. We're happy to oblige. It's just going to take some months. In the 1988 Tops podcast universe, time has no meaning. A show from week to week, could, years could pass in between. Decades disappear into minutes. It's all... A beautiful paradox. And so, Levi, we are very glad to talk about the Rangers, talk about Steve Bouchel, and also to look at this team leader's card and look at Pete Incavilia's beautiful face once again. Levi wrote an article called On Fathers, Sons, and Tops Baseball Cards. A pack of Tops Baseball Cards, Steve Bouchel, and a love of numbers brought a father and son together. And that article ends with a picture of the back of this Steve Bouchel card. He also wrote an article about the 1988 Rangers and some sweet tunes that we're going to get to a little bit later on. That has all of the elements of a great episode. So let's go to the front of 537. 
and we have Steve Bouchel. This is the perfect framing of a batter in the batter's box. Steve Bouchel, a right-handed hitter, hitting one up the middle, I think. Looks great. Very athletic stance with this follow-through. Very kind of generic gray Rangers uniform, I would say. You got you see a little bit of a mullet poking out of the back of his batting helmet. This is a great card. This is a similar shot to the Gino Petrali card. Gino was batting lefty. I think also Bob Brower in this set has a very similar stance to this. The photographer showed up for batting practice one day and got all of his shots out of the way. On this one, you can see the bat moving so quickly and it covers part of the R and the S, and it's still moving. It's a really cool effect with the 3D imagery there. Yeah, I can't tell who is on the bench watching him, but someone's kind of got his, you know, got his chin in his hand looking onward at the, the greatness of Steve Bouchel's swing. Now let's go to the back of 537. We have Steve Bouchel, third baseman. Six foot two, 190, right handed batter and thrower, drafted by the Rangers in the fifth round of 1982. Born September 26, 1961, in Lancaster, California, with a home in Fullerton, California. Early in his career, Steve was quoted as saying, It's Boo Shell, but it's been pronounced a million ways. <laughs> Boo Shelley, Buckley, Boo Chell. There have been a couple people kind of hacking it up a little. This name is of German heritage, the Americanized version of Buschel, B-U-Umlaut, C-H-E-L. That name, Buschel, with the umlauts, is a prominent name in Liechtenstein. Marcus Buschel was a head of government. There were also multiple athletic Buschels from Liechtenstein, footballers, skiers, a bobsledder, a decathlete. Steve's father was German and his mother was Swiss, so... Neither in Liechtenstein, but both right bordering Liechtenstein. His father, Hans, was a machine tool technician, and he met his wife, Hanny, on a ski trip. And Hanny was a housekeeper for ventriloquist Edgar Bergen and his daughter, Candace Bergen. And this is a throwaway line in a 1985 LA Times article, and I think could be the subject of its own podcast. (laughs) She was the housekeeper of a ventriloquist. Edgar Bergen, known for his character Charlie McCarthy, and his daughter Candace, who went on to her own TV stardom. Interestingly, Edgar Bergen went to high school just down the street from us here in Chicago at Lakeview High School. In his will, he left his daughter nothing. He left Charlie McCarthy $10,000. This did not go over well with Candace. Steve, as a child, didn't speak English when he entered kindergarten. He spoke German. Because his parents were both European immigrants, they weren't really familiar with baseball, but they were familiar with other athletic pursuits, track and field, soccer, etc. And so Steve didn't play Little League until he was 10 years old. He was born in Lancaster, California, but grew up in Fullerton, California, which is where he was making his home on the back of this card. He went to Servite High School. Servite has some prominent athletic alumni, including quarterback Steve Berline, pitcher and 2Z last name haver Mark Zepchinski, Angels pitcher Mike Witt, who was Steve's high school baseball teammate, and Richard McWilliam, who was founder of the Upper Deck Company, along with Dwayne Bice. Steve and Mike Witt played on that Servite high school baseball team with two future major league players. They won the Southern Section 4A baseball title in 1978. Bouchel pitched and played shortstop. He and Witt also played basketball together, and Steve averaged over 20 points a game as the Friars went to the sectional playoffs. According to Mike Witt, Bouchel was such a good athlete, he could have gotten a a college scholarship to play quarterback if he had wanted to. But I don't think Steve had any interest in playing football. I don't even think he played it in high school. He was so good at baseball that the White Sox took him with the ninth overall pick in the 1979 draft. Just three picks after Andy Van Slyke, one ahead of Tim Wallach. However, the sides couldn't agree on a signing bonus, and it took several months for them to come together. By the time they actually got close to a deal and the White Sox offered $105,000, Bouchel decided to reject it. By that point, it was late summer, and Steve was ready to go to Stanford on a baseball scholarship. If that offer had been made early, Steve said he would have signed right away. 
But instead, the White Sox waited too long, and, and they lost Steve Bouchelle. Instead, he went to Stanford and majored in economics. He said that if, if baseball hadn't worked out, he probably would have gone into business. And it looked after his freshman year like he might end up going that route. Yeah, he injured his shoulder his freshman year and played very little those first two years. He only had about 100 at-bats combined for the, those first two years. And Stanford's business school is pretty good. <laughs> Economics degree from there, pretty valuable. But he stuck with it and during that time had a famous roommate, another accomplished baseball player. Yankee second-round draft pick John Elway. Steve said of this situation, you get your notoriety as being a baseball player, and then you room with John Elway, and soon all of a sudden you're John Elway's roommate. <laughs> he said it was a great experience, but he was just one of the guys we lived with. He fit in with us and wasn't anything special to us. He was just a good friend. And that friendship would continue uh, throughout their lives. Elway did get picked in the second round of the 1981 Major League Draft by the Yankees, even though Yankee scouts told George Steinbrenner, this guy's going to go play football. We're never going to get him to play baseball. Elway ended up playing a ball in the summer of 1982 and hit 318. But he decided to go back to school, focus on his senior season on the Stanford football team. I think that probably worked out. I don't <laughs> know exactly what happened to that guy. But he was actually a very good baseball player. Not maybe likely to be a star, but hitting over 300 at A-ball your first season, pretty good, but probably made the right choice going to play football. He did get paid $150,000 to play that summer for mm. the Yankees. So Steve returns for his junior year healthy and played great. He had a 15-game hitting streak during which he hit 558, and for the year he hit 354 with a 995 OPS and led Stanford to the College World Series, where they made it through the West Regional. Steve was MVP uh, of that part of the tournament. So being healthy that junior year and putting up such a good performance, the Rangers decided to take a chance on Steve and that previously injured shoulder. And that takes us to the This Way to the Clubhouse on the back of the card, which is that Steve signed as a fifth-round draft selection with the Rangers June seventeenth, 1982, by scout Rick Schroeder. Not the Rick Schroeder you're thinking about. Not the guy from Silver Spoons. This Rick Schroeder was an NAIA All-American at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. He spent two years in the Giants minor league system and then went into coaching. He was a graduate assistant at the University of Arizona when they won the College World Series in 1976 with Ron Hassey. And Shorter started working with the Rangers in 1982, that same year that Steve was drafted. He spent 35-plus years in baseball with the Rangers, Royals, and Cubs. And Schroeder said, I love it. I go where they send me. Basically, I'm fishing in the river for carp. <laughs> and so I guess we'll see whether Steve was a big fish or one that got away or an old boot. Whether he's a carp or a bass, we don't know, but he is in Tulsa. And that's the first line on this card in 1982. He plays well, hitting 296 his first year while playing second and third base. 1983, he spent most of the year in Tulsa hitting 277 with 14 home runs and then gets called up to AAA Oklahoma City to close out the year. And he remained there to start 1984. And he was pretty good. He hit 264, seven home runs. On defense, he was mostly playing second base at this point, a little bit of third. With the Oklahoma City 89ers, he developed a reputation as a prankster along with the rest of the team. We haven't revisited the prank section in a while, I don't think. But there are a few that were listed in this article from the Oklahoman. In one instance, the team ran onto the field wearing black grease paint mustaches and sideburns, much to their manager's annoyance. Another situation, a teammate waited for his free glove from a manufacturer, and he's so excited to get this free glove. And then when he finds it and he gets it out of the package, he finds that every player on the 89ers had autographed it. And so he had to run out on the field because that was the only glove he had to use, and it was signed by all of his jerk teammates. <laughs> and another one that maybe borders on the hazing territory, a teammate found himself surrounded by flames as he sat in a bathroom stall. Somebody had poured a ring of lighter fluid all around the perimeter of the stall 
and lit it as he sat on the toilet. <laughs> Good, honest, clean, flammable pranks. Bly Levin approved pranks. So in 1985, the Rangers had Buddy Bell as their starting third baseman and Toby Hara was at second. So Steve's two positions are covered at the moment. Bell was an all-star in 1984 and hit 315. So Bouchelle is pretty much blocked. But the door opened. Buddy Bell, who had a contract running through 1987, was feeling like it was time to renegotiate. He wanted to increase from $600,000 to $1.5 million and made that request, and it was denied, so he asked for a trade. And he got his wish and was traded to the Reds. And this opened up a spot for Steve. He hops on a plane, joins the team in Detroit, and got right to work. In that first series, three games, he had five hits, an RBI, and a stolen base. And he was often compared to Buddy Bell. And it had to be difficult for him to come in as a rookie after a gold glove winner, an all-star, uh, and a just a kind of pillar of the team. And the Rangers weren't very good. By the time Steve got called up, they were 20 games out of first place in July. They would go on to lose 99 games. And Bouchel couldn't really keep up the magic of that first series and finished the season with a 219 average in 69 games. In 1986, Bouchel was part of that Rangers movement that we've talked about a few times with Incavilia, Ruben Sierra, and Odeby McDowell. That team won 87 games and really looked like a bright future for them. And Steve starts a run of some solid, maybe not spectacular seasons, but he's hitting 243, 18 home runs, and 54 RBIs. He had a little bit of pop. And a lot of these seasons kind of look the same. 15 to 18 home runs, 240 to 260 average. 1987 was right in that same region, 237, 13 home runs, solid on defense as a full-time third baseman. The Rangers, however, didn't progress. They finished last in the American League West with 75 wins in 1987. And that brings us to the second card, the team leaders card. The front of the card is all smiles, good vibes, good times. You've got Bouchelle here on the right, mullet in full effect. You've got Inky in the middle with a million-dollar smile. Let's see. You also have – oh, you've got Bobby Valentine, the manager. With Maybe. His, yeah, is that who that is? According to the Beckett website – this card features Bobby Valentine as manager, Pete O'Brien, who's totally obscured, Pete Incavilia, and Steve Bouchelle. Interesting. I would not have guessed that that's who, that, who those other two individuals are, but Steve is definitely laughing at something that Inky said. Do you think it's fit to repeat the joke that Incavilia said, or do you think that this is something? What do you think he said? I'm going to guess that we probably can't say it, even if we knew it. You know, I heard that this one time in Oklahoma City, these, this guy sitting on the toilet. <laughs> in the vein of these team leaders cards, none of the guys on the front of the card are on the back of the card. Yes, as we flip to the back of 201, you see a couple standouts. So Ruben Sierra, as we've talked about on the pod, 35 doubles, 169 hits along with Scott Fletcher. Sierra with 109 RBIs. This was a decent offensive team. Larry Parrish is listed as the home run leader, but they had 230 home run guys. Inky had 27 home runs. They scored the fifth most runs in the American League, but on the pitching side, when Charlie Huff is your only starter with a better than average ERA, you're going to be in for a rough time. He also had 40 starts, as we said on the Charlie Huff episode. To this day, that is the last time a pitcher has had 40 starts in a season. They put the whole team on Charlie Huff's very old back. They gave up the third most runs in the American League behind Cleveland and Baltimore, and those teams were the two worst teams in the AL East. And that's how you end up with a decent offense, but in last place in the West. Yeah, 1988, not much better. The team continues to underperform. There are 20 games under 500. Bouchelle, for his part, was the most valuable player on the Rangers. He had a 4.3 war, 
And this was the best year of his career. He had 250 with 16 home runs, but doubled his walks. So that made his OPS plus better, a 107, which is the first time in his career it was above the league average of 100. And he was also in the top 10 in putouts and assists among third base. But David, really, the 1988 season, we don't think about because of their performance on the field, because that was pretty blah. Really, there was a record of solid gold hits burning up the charts in 1988. This record, Rangers, that's a that's a pretty boring name for a, <laughs> an album about the Rangers. It's just called Rangers, a promotional vinyl record from 1988. Thanks again to, to Levi Weaver for this article in The Athletic, reviewing Rangers, a promotional vinyl record from 1988. The the article should have appeared on Pitchfork, given the importance of the music that it is reviewing here. Matt, this record opens with the Sidemen, Line Drive to the Heart. And this definitely sounds like the opening of a sitcom, maybe starring Patrick <laughs> Duffy. And also, Line Drive to the Heart. You should get that checked out. <laughs> yeah, Line Drive to the Heart could definitely kill you. But these smooth tunes could save your life. I especially like Los Tres Compañeros and and the Rangers rap. <laughs> the Rangers rap, I think the best part about the Rangers rap, and uh, full credit to Levi, he said that that one is also his favorite. The best part about that one is it's, only like a minute and a half of song. This does remind me that a lot of rap in the 80s was not very good. Oh, you take that back right now. <laughs> but this Sugar and Spice doing the Rangers rap is uh, fantastic. So, David, when I think of 1980s Texas music, I don't think of smooth sitcom jams. I don't think of rap. This High Ho Rangers Away, this very smooth country and western tune is exactly what i'm considering hi ho rangers away it's time to get down texas rangers are riding to town our chemo sabi his name is bobby hi ho rangers away showdowns are brewing we're calling them out bats are blazing there'll be no doubt when it's all done We'll be top gun, high old rangers away, high old rangers away. Yeah, it's 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 pretty good. I also I do like that at least two or three of the songs reference Bobby Valentine, a guy who's certainly not going to get fired in a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> that would never happen. You know, three years into his reign as manager, they just seemed really. Really into Bobby Valentine after one over 500 season. <laughs> well, it was giving them high hopes. And so they rode that for a very l- while. <laughs> In 1989, on the high hopes of that amazing album, the Rangers decided to show even more ambition by making some trades. They brought in Rafael Palmero and Jamie Moyer from the Cubs. They brought in Julio Franco from Cleveland. They also signed free agent Nolan Ryan, huge Texas name. Steve was particularly excited about this as a Southern California kid who grew up watching Nolan Ryan pitch when he was with the Angels. And so in 1989, with those new additions, the Rangers are back over 500, but still fourth in the West. Bouchelle fell back below average at the plate hitting 235 with 16 home runs. One highlight of 1989 for Steve was getting accused of stealing signs and telling Brian Harper exactly what he thinks about that accusation. (laughs) And and that led to a brawl. Steve was not afraid to get in a guy's face. Almost every video that I found that was a highlight of Steve Bouchelle also included a a fight. (laughs) But that fight in spirit took the... Rangers over 500 in 1989. But meanwhile, at Double A, Tulsa, the Rangers have a kid named Dean Palmer hitting 25 home runs. It's a little bit of foreshadowing the mm. third base future. 
Yeah, because 1990, Steve is missing significant time due to an injury. First, in April, he was hit by a pitch by the aptly named Eric Plunk, and that broke Steve's wrist. He missed 29 games, and then in June, he had another wrist injury, missed another 27 games. In August, he was involved in another brawl with the White Sox. Nolan Ryan, earlier in the game, had thrown at Craig Graybeck after Graybeck suggested that the umpire check a ball for funny business. So Greg Hibbard then throws at Steve Bouchelle. Maybe because of that injury history and knowing that he's already been hurt on the wrist, he turns around and immediately takes off for the pitcher. He ends up injuring his ribs, (laughs) so not his wrist, but it leads to a benches clearing brawl. Bouchelle ends up injured, misses some time due to injury, and then he gets suspended. And with all these interruptions, he had a really tough season in 1990. He he only played in 91 games and hit 215. And 1991 is Bouchelle's last year of his contract, and he was hoping to get a big payday. He needs a good performance in 91, and he does it at the plate. Through 121 games, he had 18 home runs and an OPS plus of 117, and still very good defensively. But, again, Dean Palmer, now in AAA, had hit 22 home runs through the first 60 games at AAA and earns the call-up, and it looks like the writing's on the wall for Steve. Palmer was clearly the next third baseman for the Rangers, but when they brought him up, they didn't want to move Bouchelle, who was hitting well, who was still respected and liked by the team they wanted him there as a leader but they had his replacement ready if perhaps the right offer comes along meanwhile the pirates have a hole at third base in 1991 they're challenging for that national league east title bobby bonilla is a mostly an outfielder at this point and so pirates management calls the rangers trying to work out a trade And they're calling throughout the season, trying to bring Bouchelle over. And Texas kept saying no. Then as the season progresses, the Rangers are out of contention. Tom Grieve, the Rangers GM, told Pittsburgh he would trade Bouchelle for two of the Pirates' top three prospects. The Pirates say, no way. Then, season continues to progress and they get desperate around the trade deadline. And finally, they make the deal. Tom Greaves said he was never more excited about a trade in my 10 years as a GM. He got two can't-miss prospects. And I'm sure to this day, Texas Rangers fans talk about legends Kurt Miller and Hector Fajardo. Two of my favorite players of all time. You know, I wear my Hector Fajardo jersey. You know, it's a family heirloom. Uh, Mm -hmm. Unfortunately... Hector had a career 6.95 ERA in 30 games and was out of baseball by age 25. Miller was a real highly thought of prospect. At one point, was the, he was the number 24 prospect in baseball in 1991, but he never made it higher than double A for the Rangers. He would make the majors for Florida and the Cubs, but was not a regular performer. Meanwhile, in Pittsburgh, Bouchelle hit 246 down the stretch for the Pirates. But his combined season numbers were pretty good. A career best, 262 average. Also, career highs, 22 home runs and 85 RBIs. For those 121 games he played in Texas, he led the American League in third base fielding percentage at 991, which is one of the best percentages in league history. And after the trade, he got to play in the playoffs for the first time in his career. Very solid in the NLCS, hitting 304 in a seven-game series that Pittsburgh lost to Atlanta. He then re-signed with the Pirates that winter, but was traded to the Cubs for left-hander Danny Jackson the next July. He spent parts of three seasons with the Cubs. In 93, he had a career-high average of 272. Again, 15 home runs seems about par for Steve Bouchelle. And this was his best slash line season. He had a 782 OPS. 1994, his average drops a little bit, but still good for 14 home runs before the strike ended the season. And 95 was his last year. He's hitting only 189 and midway through the season was released. Texas brings him back in July of 1995 for a short-term deal, a month after Dean Palmer had a ruptured bicep that cut short what was looking to be a really good year for Palmer. Unfortunately, Bouchelle didn't really work out as a replacement. He only appeared in nine games. 
hit 125 and then called it a career. So closing the book on Steve Bouchelle, he played in 1,334 games in the major leagues, hitting 137 home runs, 547 RBIs, and more than 1,000 hits. Several times in his career, he finished on the defensive leaderboard for the season for third baseman, top 10 in putouts, assists, range, and fielding percentage. And he is on the Rangers' all-time top 10 list for sacrifice hits. He's number tenth. ten. <laughs> ten, ten. <laughs> He's ten. Quite, it, but still a legacy. He's on the board. How about in retirement? Steve and his wife Nancy live in Arlington, Texas. For thirteen years, Steve was out of baseball. He was working in real estate. He spent time raising his kids, driving them to sports practices, and doing all kinds of dad stuff. And he had four kids. Matt, on the show, we like to get up close and personal. <laughs> Yes, this might be the most personal information that we've learned about a player. The Bushells plan to have four kids. After the birth of their fourth child, Steve decided to have a medical procedure done. And not long afterwards, Nancy wasn't feeling well and, and took a home pregnancy test. And apparently, Steve's vasectomy didn't work. She let Steve know that she was pregnant while he was away at a John Elway charity golf event. In 1998, the Bouchelles welcomed baby Shane. The doctor was a family friend, and he joked that he was going to be on the hook for college tuition. It turns out that Shane didn't really need the tuition help. John Elway teases Steve that he should have known that Shane would be a quarterback because of the way that he snuck in. (laughs) That's a bad joke, John Elway. Bad joke. (laughs) Shane was a really good high school quarterback, and he was recruited to play at some pretty big universities, including Oklahoma, and he would have joined the family tradition. One brother, Garrett, played baseball at OU before getting drafted by the Giants. Both of his sisters, Jordan and Amber, went to Oklahoma as well. He had another brother who played baseball at Fullerton University, uh, back where his dad grew up. But three of his siblings went to OU. Unfortunately, a coaching change led the Sooners in a different direction quarterback wise so Shane picked the obvious second choice here University of Texas at Austin and there's a really good picture of the whole family with horns down and Shane wearing his Texas orange Garrett said fans in Austin told me I sucked for three years so it's kind of weird to hear them giving my brother love (laughs) Shane won the Longhorn's starting job as a freshman and set a freshman passing yards record with nearly 3,000 yards. He was injured his sophomore season and missed significant time, and he only played two games his junior year, so he redshirted. As a graduate student, he used his two years of eligibility at Southern Methodist, and for the Mustangs, he was outstanding. He compiled 7,000 passing yards and 57 touchdowns over two years. He ended up going undrafted, but signed with the Chiefs, and as of last year, was on the Kansas City Chiefs roster. He's a little bit small, only 6'1", isn't likely to take over for Mahomes just yet, but Shane's very existence defied odds, so who knows? Maybe he'll be the Chiefs starter someday. Shane said, I don't know if it's an accomplishment, but I'm glad to be here of the situation around his birth. Mini Pearl couldn't have said it better. <laughs> After a few years wrangling his more numerous than expected family, Steve got back into baseball with the Rangers, initially hired to coach Class A Bakersfield. He then moved up to Double A with the Frisco Rough Riders and then Triple A with the Round Rock Express. He served as a bench coach and first base coach between 2015 and 18 for the Rangers Big League Club. In 2019, he shifted to the front office where he served as a special assistant for baseball operations. The Rangers hired a new GM in 2020, so I'm not sure if he's still there. But in 2021, he was on a rotating guest panel for Rangers pre- and post-game shows. Well, we've covered a lot of ground in this episode, and we've learned a lot about Steve Bouchelle, including about his family planning methods. But now what do we think? This was a card that this was for Levi, who wrote in to us to request this card, this was his favorite card. What do we think now that we've looked into Steve Bouchelle a little bit more? Steve was a solid third baseman for the Rangers for seven years, and he played well for the Pirates and Cubs after that. 
From 1987 to 91, he averaged 243, 15 home runs, and 56 RBIs. It's all right. That's an average of two war a season over that stretch. According to Baseball References shorthand, that's a starter. He was a decent starter. Solid, if unspectacular, on offense, and really good with the glove. He was also hard-nosed, not afraid to mix it up, as we saw from those multiple brawls. He was well-liked by his teammates and managers. GM Tom Grieve, who traded him away, said, I've never met anybody who doesn't like Steve. Actually, if you ever meet somebody who doesn't like Steve, you need to check that guy out and not worry about what he thinks of (laughs) Steve. (laughs) And so, getting back to Levi's story, this is the first card that Levi saw that said Texas Rangers. He didn't know that the that Texas had a baseball team. This is his first Rangers card, and Bouchelle became his favorite player. And as I hold my mint condition Steve Bouchelle card, I look at the picture that Levi posted of his, his well-worn card from childhood that he kept around, that he flipped back and forth and looked at the stats on. He wrote his name on it to mark it as his. He underlined the season that Steve Bouchelle was with the Rangers. And that card in that pack connected Levi and his dad. It led Levi down a path of studying stats, of looking at the back of these cards and and learning about the different cities and the different statistics and how you measure those different stats and what they mean in baseball and learning about the players. And that's exactly why this podcast exists. This is, if I look back at the cards that I had as a kid, they're a mess because I just would flip them back and forth and look at the guy and then look at the card and then learn about the cities that they were from. And that was what opened a kind of globe of baseball to me. This allowed Levi to travel along this path to exotic locations like Fullerton, California and Tulsa and and Oklahoma City. Because of Levi finding that card, we're able to learn about famous roommates and ventriloquists and botched vasectomies. But maybe more importantly, because of this card, Levi became a Rangers fan and then a reporter, and wrote that article about the 1988 Rangers promo record. So for that, thank you, Steve Bouchelle. Indeed, the butterfly effect of a Steve Bouchelle card and all of the good that it brought into the world. So thank you, Levi, for the request. Thank you, David, for the story. And thank you to you listening at home. If you've ever given $10,000 to a dummy, we'd love to hear from you on Twitter. We're at Tops 1988. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you next week.